What's going on, Spit and Chicklets fans? You know the drill. This interview is brought to you by No Days Wasted, the creators of DHM Detox, the vitamin for people that drink. DHM Detox is a recovery formula with a blend of natural ingredients, vitamins, and electrolytes that help you bounce back after drinking alcohol. Forget the next day nausea, brain fog, and anxiety. It's time to be smart and responsible about when you drink and DHM Detox is your go-to drinking buddy that helps boost your body's natural response to drinking. It's risk-free purchase, so if you don't love it, they'll give you your money back. And as a bonus, here's a sneak peek at their Rapid Immunity Hydration product that is coming soon. Sign up for the email updates at nodayswastedco.com to stay in the loop. They're focused on creating functional, science-backed products that help you be your best. Also, I can't forget, No Days Wasted has also donated $10,000 to the ECHL Player Relief Fund, and they're offering 20% off your order of DHM Detox using the Biz20 promo code. Just head over to their website at nodayswastedco.com for no days wasted after drinking. Now, enjoy the interview. Well, our next guest is one of the most accomplished pugilists in NHL history. He plied his trade for 16 seasons with three teams, racking up 1,020 games and an unfathomable 333 fights, and that's just the NHL. He's third all-time in penalty minutes with 3,515. Welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, the Albanian assassin, Ty Domi. <laughs> oh, <laughs> how about that intro? Are you impressed? That's nice. That's Dusted nice. that one. He's like, Albanian I've assassin. Better. I haven't heard that in a long time. Yeah, I remember I remember you broke in. That was, uh, was your nickname for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. But oh my God, we got so much to cover. I mean, um, of course, the fighting aspect. You were actually a pretty fucking decent player, too. I think a lot of people forget that as well. Um, and, and, you know, maybe some off-ice accomplishments as well. Um, let's start off maybe with the Peterborough Peets. Well, that's, uh, that goes way back, you know. Um, my first day training camp, I, uh, I showed up with a broken hand. Uh, From <laughs> what, bar fight? Wh- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which didn't go over too well, but uh, it was what it was, and I had to get it fixed, and... So this bull mentality, this kind of stemmed from childhood. Like you were always a wrecking ball, and, and I, I don't want to use the term maybe the shortest of the bunch, but you had to fight for everything you got. Well, I think it all started when I was a young kid. Uh, you know, we didn't know what dys- dyslexia was back then, but uh, you know, I had to get through school, and uh, you know, I I was always sticking up for you know the, the guys who were the academics and the smart ones and the, the guys that everybody picked on I always stuck up for those guys because they helped me get through school <laughs> you know guys and girls so um, that was really um, how I got through school um, being dyslexic and uh, I was an athlete so I was usually the best best athlete in school so, <laughs> so I, I got through sports uh, through school with sports and uh, obviously protecting uh, the academics who helped me get through tests and exams and everything else are you pretty are people aware you're, you're dyslexic yeah i think it became known uh, once i got turned pro we didn't really know when i was a kid right uh, my mom would always say my son's no dummy <laughs> you know they actually i, I got i got sent uh, to a um you know a, a, a school that you know had challenges for for kids to uh, for learning and i was there for a week and not even a week i don't think and uh the principal called me in and said, you don't belong here. So I went home to my mother and father and said uh, I was in the wrong place. So I had to go back to, you know, the normal school. And uh, I just, you know, the the, uh, the coaches and the principal were happy I came back to the normal school. <laughs> and actually <laughs> for the sports teams. But, <laughs> but they gave me. 50s. Not for the right reasons, they, unfortunately. They, they gave me 50s. They gave me 50s. The one teacher in grade five, she uh, she wasn't very nice. She actually failed me. But uh you know, I, I, I'll never forget, uh, you know, that feeling of failing and all your friends moving on. But uh, that's what you that's what you kind of live with when you're growing up. And we didn't know any better. Well, so then you always knew you were going to be a player and, and move on. Was college never, ever an option or, or was it obviously <laughs> right to junior and, and try to make it pro? Well, it, it, it was always an option, but it was not a realistic option for me. <laughs> you know, having uh, scholarships in football and soccer and Believe it or not, I had uh, probably you know thirty something schools in in soccer and twenty something schools in football. 
as a kicker. <laughs> I was a middle Get backer. Get the fuck out of here, Middle really? backer, running back, and kicker and punter, but uh, I never left the field. Do you, still, do you still kick it around? No, I, no, but I actually ended up playing for the Argos um, a couple of exhibition games. I don't have any Stanley Cup rings, but I got two great cup rings. Come on. <laughs> yeah, wow. swear really? to God. So you were playing yeah. around uh, the time Pinball Clemens was? Yeah, yeah, I was there with all those guys. It was a, it was a pretty interesting time. Michael Shea just won uh, the great cup for Winnipeg, and he was on the team. But Doug Flutie. That was a pretty special time being with Doug Flutie, and he yeah, when I kicked the field goals, he actually held it, so it was pretty cool. Oh wow, no huh? Was That's hockey cool. your best sport though, or because you no, actually hockey though? was my third sport out of all the sports. I, I got uh, recruited. I, I was being looked at by you know Division two, II, Division three schools, <laughs> just a couple of them. But flip, soccer, it was all over the country. And once they found out that uh, you know academics wasn't my uh, my strength, I. Uh, I went and and my father wouldn't let me go to Europe to play soccer when I was 16. So uh, he let me go to Peterborough when I was 16 uh, for training camp and got into two 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 or three fights the first day. So I made the team. <laughs> were you fighting? Were you fighting in minor hockey all the time as well, or? Uh, not really. I usually stick it up for my friends growing up. But I think the one time uh, I tell people they go they go where did it really kick in that you're right gonna, you're going to be a fighter i'm like well when i was 12 years old my brother's five years older than me and he was getting beat up by this guy and i i saw this guy and my brother just pounding away and uh, he had white bleach blonde hair and uh i just jumped jumped on him and started wailing on him <laughs> and he was five years older than me so after the you know the, and the guy had bleach blonde hair it was covered in blood and i'm like whoa this is pretty scary looking so i'm at home and uh, i hear the door bang real hard at, at home and my mother answers the door and the, the father says look what your son did look what your son did to my son and my brother my brother standing there next to my mother he thinks it's my brother the, the father so i come between and i'm much smaller and i'm like mom i'm sorry mr proctor and he's, and he's almost in shock and, and, he look, and he's looking down at me and he's like He's like, he did that to you? He kicked his son in the butt. <laughs> Get your ass home. <laughs> oh, no, he was embarrassed. Yeah, so I think that's really where I was kind of became more fearless. Um, but then Junior C, when I was 14 years old, you know, fighting 19, 20-year-olds, um, I think the one time <laughs> getting a getting a, a police escort out of Wallsburg after I beat up the 20-year-old captain, and there was blood all over him, too. I was just sat on him, and I... <laughs> punched him like 30 times <laughs> so i think that's you know when when you're 14 years old you kind of you know what i mean how old were you your very first on ice fight for, was it 14 in that league or was it like even below that uh it was probably it was probably 12 um to be honest but it wasn't really it wasn't really a fight fight yeah but uh Junior C was, you know, you know when you start I'm fighting men, right? And I was fearless, so I fought anybody, and, I, you know, I didn't really know any better. So I was 14 playing with 18, 19, 20 years. And then when I was 15, I played Junior B, and I had 350-something minutes and penalties. I <laughs> led the league in penalty minutes. So I think I was kind of born a fighter. Uh, people ask me, you know, why'd you fight so much? And I always stuck up for my, my friends growing up, kids, and, um, you know, the people who helped me get through school. That's really where it really started but uh i think once i started playing junior c i did it and junior b i did it and then junior a i kind of was you know mike ricci was my centerman and uh you know we went to ohl finals then we went to the then we went to the um memorial cup um and i got drafted uh, as a tough guy really but uh i, I people have kind of forgot what i got drafted i actually can skate like yeah you're a place. second rounder <laughs> like you, they, they they drafted you for the whole package <laughs> 27th overall i tell People now tell kids that's go, a first rounder. They go, now they go, "You were a first rounder." <laughs> no, there's only 19 teams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a ways back for sure. So, since you were so used to fighting all these guys older than you, like when you even when you jumped up to the NHL level, were you nervous at that point? Now you were going to be going at the best in the world, or were you excited for that challenge? Well, my first fight in junior A was against the toughest guy in the league named Mark LaForge, and I went right. <laughs> the coach, talk about coaches, <laughs> he comes in a room, and I'm 16 years old, and he's looking around the room. He's like, I don't want anybody fighting that number 18 out there. And he's looking around, except one guy, 
and I was kind of, you know, I was a rookie. I was dressing behind the door, and I'm like, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> Just pop your head out. Yeah. I got him. So I kind of was looking forward to it, you know. And it's the same thing when I got to the NHL. I was looking forward to fighting Bob Probert. So I was uh, I was a fearless kid, and yeah, I, I'm, I was one of the few rare guys that uh, liked doing it. So take me through a game day, though. You wake up, and, and, and as the day progresses, and before your pregame <laughs> nap, you're te- are, are you what not- When game day? So when I was early and single, or when I was married and uh, – <laughs> I meant, I, meant, I meant even early on. I mean, take me through the whole career. Like early on, would you be getting as nervous um, as some guys do? Well, uh, I never really got nervous. Um, actually, I was too small to get nervous. I always had to be calm and in control. And you know, I was too small, right? Everybody was twice my size usually, most of the time. So, but I knew I could hurt them because I threw both hands. And uh, you know, they a lot of guys got to know that no I, butterflies whatsoever right before you dropped the gloves with with Bob Probert. No. No. Jesus Christ! No, no, that, not not too, no. Ty. Not too many guys have that yeah. ability. That you you were yeah, born with. I know that. that's yeah, it's not kind of normal, but uh, <laughs> I, hate, I hate to admit it now, but uh, it's the truth. Yeah, and, you know, screws I, loose. <laughs> <laughs> not screws loose. I just you know I uh, I, I love to play the game, and uh, you know I could have played other sports, and I wanted to be a hockey player, being a Canadian kid, and that was my dream, and you know that's how I got there, and my, my toughness got me there, and you know legitimately I can sit here and stare at you guys and tell you that. I made it because uh, because of my fighting. Then I, you know, I got more room. Then I became a better player. Uh, you know, I could play in junior, but people forgot that I could play in junior. So I had to kind of reestablish myself uh, as a hockey player. Well, your best years were were with Toronto later in your career, as far as offensive numbers. Well, that was Pat Burns is doing. Uh, he challenged me to to uh, condition myself better and be a better player and uh, practice hard. And he said, if you practice hard for me, I'll make you a better player and you'll play in the playoffs for me. And he did. And I ended up playing with uh, with Sundin and Gilmore in the playoffs and against Chicago. Another interesting stat about you is is you had the second most uh, Maple Leafs playoff games ever, correct? Well, for right wingers, yeah, after George Armstrong. So uh, that's for right wingers. Excuse th- me. That, that's yeah, third all time, which you know is a, is, is something that uh, you know you take a lot of pride in playing a lot of playoff games. Of course, we had great goaltenders. You know, we had uh, Eddie Belford and Curtis Joseph. So I, I tell my son now in, in Montreal, you got Carey Price. You make it to the playoffs. You never know what can, can happen. So that's just uh, you know that was a, a, a blessing playing in Toronto and my hometown, and uh, you know Matt Sundin, obviously, who was the guy who who made it happen. Uh, he was the guy. We never really had that second guy, so Matt's and Eats. our goalies kind of usually did it. But uh, you know, as you know, Biz, you know, as a tough guy um, in playoffs, you get to just play. You don't have to think about fighting. And every game I played over a thousand games, I had to dress every game thinking I might have to fight no matter what. So right? it was almost a distraction mentally. Were, were you, well, did you think, feel more comfortable in playoffs? Well, you just had to like really. Like I told you, I was small, so I, I had to really focus, right? And uh, guys are big in my era. They were they were tough and they were mean and they could fight. You know, I'm not saying guys can't fight now. I don't think that they know how to fight as well, and I don't think they really, you know, they they don't really fight to hurt you. You know, nowadays it's kind of just like you'd be lucky to see a hit nowadays. You know, you guys so. didn't have YouTube. Were you watching tapes though, the VHSs and studying guys and stuff? Uh, no, but you know, being dyslexic, I was one of those guys that uh, you know, visually, when you see something, you uh, you remember. And so I always knew what guy, how guys fought, and uh, what hand they threw. So that was kind of uh, you know the the photographic. Very memory interesting. You yeah. run it through your head a couple times during the yeah. course of the day. Yeah, and and, and that was uh, that was the thing that I I really had to do is I had to outsmart everybody when I fought them <laughs> because they're they're twice my size and I had to and you know guys used to stand there and, and throw toe to toe and I said there's no way I can I can st- you know um, sustain this and and last in the NHL I have to change it and I actually did change the way uh, guys do fight you know I said I'm not going to sit there and take punches that's stupid you know so well I, I mean even you were pretty hardcore I was talking to Cam Jansen the other day and we're like man like people we were kind of the last of the fighters so people think we we're like these tough guys we didn't fight can do it like the guys before us those guys you i mean you guys even guys before you they would just stand mm-hmm. in the pocket and they yeah would just even guys before me and when i you know i was just too small to to stand there and go toe-to-toe and i tried that a few times and you know it was like yeah no i'm not gonna keep doing this so i, I actually changed and it, it was a blessing playing with joe kosher when i was young he came to new york and he threw he threw the, the right bomb and he said ty you throw both hands and you throw hard he said you know you don't want your hands looking like this," he said. 
don't waste punches and take the helmet off. So I literally started, you know, getting in and taking guys' helmets off, then throwing bombs, you know. But it was all about the grip and always about the stance and always about being calm. And I always tell people, people say, how did you do it? You always look calm, which was crazy. You don't uh, yeah. know if it's a, it's a, a quote-unquote act or not, yeah, right? Yeah, and I think when people get mad, they, they, they overreact and they're not in control. And that's not the way to fight, <laughs> especially in the NHL. When you you're you know who's probably the best at it now is Reeves. You watch him before a fight, and it's like, his heart rate slows down. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. just very patient and, and calm. And I hate to keep beating the fighting horse, but yeah. I think people want to know about the psychological aspect beside, well, behind you know, a guy of your people, size to people go People always ask me, and you guys are hockey show, so I, I don't I don't mind doing it. You know, it's you've been asking me for a long time, Biz. You were good to Max, so I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, That's share, a whole share different stories. thing uh, we got to get into uh, <laughs> later on. What, what a great kid! Um, do you want to talk about Burnsy? Actually, I wanted to go back to Probert for a second. You fought him across the street. That epic brawl, and you give the old, you know, got the t- the title belt. Was that a predetermined thing you were doing, or did that happen spontaneously? Well, that was the days of the Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man's and all that stuff. And Proby tells a story when when we actually before we fought the first time, I'm like, "Come on, let's go, a Macho Man, let's go!" <laughs> <laughs> what a shot at the title. You know? So it was a whole it was a whole gimmick back then. But the belt thing, you know, I felt that I got the better of him in the first one, and uh, you know, he was the champ, and uh, he would always be the champ. So oh. um, he was a he was a very very uh, great um, special individual that I got to know after our careers. I was going to say, what was your off ice relationship? I got to know him after. Okay, um, you know, we, we had too much of a big rivalry to right. yeah. to get Tommy close to our ice. times. Yeah. But after I got to know him, and it, um, you know, he, he was he was like a big teddy bear family guy, and uh, he he said to me, uh, he said, and we spent some quality time together he's a real family guy and everything and and uh he'd say uh ty he goes i couldn't hurt you (laughs) and i said proby i know that's why i knew i could beat you and uh you know when when he said that to me i was like yeah because he hit me with his hardest in the first one and if you watch the replay of the second one it looks like i go down at the end (laughs) we were just so tired he was so big right and he was but it didn't hit me to go go down. I, he couldn't hurt me, right? So um, we were just so tired at the end of that fight. And he was, and he's a heavy guy, so he, we just fell at the end. But it looks like he hit, but he didn't hit me, and he knew it. So he admitted it, and he admitted a lot of things to me. But uh, those are things that I'll, I'll cherish the rest of my life. I don't think I should share uh, special things. He said. Uh, the first time I met you, you told me how much you hated the word goon. Uh, I think that'd be a good conversation between. Do you, you want and me to get up right now and not finish this conversation? Yeah, the G word. The G word. I'm sorry. The oh, G you. Word. Oh, you hate it that much. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay, so it's like a, a trigger yeah. word. And so did Proby, and so did Joey Kosher, and I consider those two guys the greatest uh, of it. And uh, those guys didn't talk about fighting, and those guys didn't like that word, and I didn't. I never liked talking about it, and I don't like that word. All right, I, like I, I'm swear down word. with it. I know you guys are. You know, I, I like to stay keep things PG, and I knew I'm coming on here. You guys swear and everything, which yeah. is fine. And you know, oh yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, the PG thing. I you know, I, I'll stick to the PG. But I, I can say a lot of things about that G word that. Uh, you know, especially a lot of people that, that use it. I can say a lot, but I won't say it. Oh, you're I, saying, I have to stick to being okay, PG. So, so it just upsets you maybe uh, like some media and have painted yeah, people in a certain yeah, light. Yeah, and, there's, a lot of, there's, a, there's a lot of guys in, in, in the world, especially the media, yeah. Uh, there's certain guys that, you know, have a stance on it. And I actually tried this, what you're doing, <laughs> when I retired with TSN. And, uh, you know, the guy there that's running TSN, he was running the hockey news for years and years. And he was the... He was the guy who hated fighting the most. And then <laughs> when I took the job and, uh, you know, I, I dipped my toe in the water there, you know, but everything you say at uh, TSN, that they tell you what to say. And they wanted me to go on national TV Wednesday, coast to coast between uh, the doubleheader game and say fighting doesn't belong in hockey because someone's going to die. And I'm like. No, I am not saying that. You know how big it would be if you say it? I don't give a shit. I am not saying it. Because <laughs> you don't believe it. I don't believe it. Do you, so, are you happy with how it's declined and now it's it's more so just, you know, Well, that's a reality. That's the way the world's changing. You know, the world's changing, as you see in the whole For world. Sure. Um, it's changed not just in sports, but in the corporate world and, and everything, everything you say now. And you got to be a little delicate on everything. And the fighting aspect of things, you know, guys can get hurt and... Um, but that's why I did a book, you know, um, after Wade died, who Wade Belak, who I was very close with, you know, he's like my little brother for five years. He sat next to me and I always kept him involved. And when I retired, it was a, 
it was a tough thing to uh, to see uh, the whole situation evolve um, with him and I didn't go back to the Arcana Center when I retired at all uh, and I actually happened to go to one game um, I think it was uh, yeah the, the year after I retired but I didn't go for a long time and when I walked in I guess, coming up the stairs and I ran into Wade Belak's wife Jen and she goes Ty Ty can you please go talk to Wade? He's ha- struggling. He's having a tough time. I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. So I, I go in there after the first period, and uh, he's in there working out. He's not playing, and he went through. Speaking of Cam Jansen's, he hit Thomas Caberle. Right, Wade didn't play for like 15 games or something, and cam jansen in new jersey hits thomas cavalier wade doesn't play for i don't know how many games don't quote me on 10 or 15 games he doesn't play until they play jersey again he plays he goes at cam jansen fights him and he's back out again he doesn't you know what i mean so he was like spiraling really quick and um he was you know that kind of really hit home because after what happened to him um and then pro b dying and you know, a lot there of there was a tough stretch there. Rip yeah, with, went, uh, with all the well. guys who were in the brotherhood that kind of did it, and oh, I did it the most. And I'm like, you know, and when I retired, I went through tough times um, financially and stuff. And I could have done a book, and I said no. I said no. I said kept saying no. And then they said, well, you had the most fights. You got to do a book. I said, I'm not doing it. Not I'm ready. Not, not ready. I'm not ready. And I, was, I could have done a book, and when I was, you know, tough times and everything, I said no, no. So I held out. I held out. I held out. And finally, I just said I had enough. I, let's let's do this. And I, I wanted to shine a positive light on on you know the job I did and um, what what we all did. And that was because I protected my teammates. And uh, Simon Schuster tried to make it all about fighting and hockey and hockey. And that's not why I did the book. I actually did the book about you know protecting the people in Chapter Eleven. And they kept trying to take the chapter chapter 11 out that was you know the waiters the shoe shine guys the tsa guys you know those type of everyday people waiters bartenders i tried to stick up for those people because i think the new world has changed so much and uh, you know how i was brought up with my father and everybody else that's our age kind of you know treat people you want to be treated old school values and that's why i did it all those guys that died and so i i tried to shine a positive light on on fighting and uh you know i ended up being you know number one best uh, seller in canada and number, in five weeks in a row in canada is pretty good for you know a guy that's just a so-called fighter that uh so i even those writers that you know cut up fighting and everything else you know i'm not a writer they're writers and none of them have ever had a number one bestseller in five weeks in a row so so i i I got a lot i got a lot out of uh, doing that book let me tell you though it's it's a tiring thing doing a book and doing a tour and going out to suicide well you probably you probably write all down these stories or 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 talk to them with whoever's uh helping with it and then i'm imagining you got to trim some of it out at some point because you're like ah maybe this would upset this well you know i'm dyslexic right so i had to listen to it and okay uh, of course ended up going on a trip to Italy um, and uh, you know I, we, I kept saying no I walked away because they kept taking chapter 11 out <laughs> crazy enough and right. tried to make it hockey hockey fighting fighting and I was like that's not why I'm doing the book Right. I wanted to do it about treat people I want to be treated old school values some life lessons that I learned going through tough times yeah, yeah. and stuff and uh, treat people I want to be treated dedicated to my father and uh, so that's I, at the end of the day and I could tell anybody that's going to do a book make sure you have every single line every single page in your contract that you get final say because of course yeah that's how i did it <laughs> yeah, yeah. um we got to go back to the toronto days you mentioned pat burns and uh chuck gomez was talking about him and just how stern he was and how he demanded the best from his players and he was kind of a scary guy yeah he, uh i was playing in winnipeg and i was lined up in front of the bench in, uh, in toronto and i heard someone from the toronto bench say hey da-da-da. you know i'm like turn around and it burns goes no i'm serious ty i'd love to have him on my right side <laughs> so he was tampering yeah <laughs> so a week a week or 10 days later i ended up uh, getting a phone call that i'm traded to toronto and it was pat burns i told you i wanted you <laughs> so uh you know we kind of hit it off like right away and when i got to toronto uh he said uh, i'm gonna make you in the player just you know this and this and this and he was a special a special coach i think uh, him and pat i was very blessed to have him and pat quinn as my coaches and uh, the one funny story was in uh <laughs> in chicago we have a little five-on-five brawl 
and uh, he coached Chris Chelios in Montreal, and that was his favorite player at all time. So we have a five on five, and Chelios the only one that's not you know. And I'm, everybody else is lined you know paired up with someone and so it's chelly so i grabbed chelly and right uh, i got it i got it cocked back right and chelly's like you know and i go chelly what are you doing he said i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so i just kind of let him go oh you let him go i let him go all right and then after the period pat burns you had him at the tip of your fingers what did you do you let him off the hook i'm like you know, I didn't say anything, right? In front of the whole team and everything. And he was like, you had him. He's going, you had him at the tip of your fingers. You had him. He talks like he's God, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And he kind of was at the time. Yeah, of you course. Know, he was the whole Chicago Blackhawks. So anyway, we fly back to Toronto. And uh, trainers say, Pat wants you in his office. So I walk in there, and he's got his Mr. Briefs on, nothing else. <laughs> it's quite the sight. <laughs> but he, he stands up. And uh, I, I'm ready to, I thought he was going to blast me. And he he says, come here. Uh, I walk over. He's got Mr. Brief. <laughs> he goes, I love you, man. Gave you a hug. He goes, I'm I'm so sorry about that. He goes, you showed him respect. Yeah, and, for sure. You know, you know that was very uh, respectful of you. And I love him. And, uh, you know, uh, that was very, very nice. I'm very sorry for snapping on you. <laughs> so that was the kind of bond that we had. And, you know, that was one. It first kind of kicked in that, you know, this guy's pretty cool. What did he see in you that maybe you didn't see in yourself and, and how we helped develop your game? Like, what what were the areas where he's like, I think you can get better here. I, I see it. And, well, and, he and, saw me in junior, right? Okay. And I was playing a top line with Mike Ricci. So I think he, he thought I could do that in the NHL. And, uh, you know, he, he did it. He actually lived by his word. In the playoffs, I played with Sundin and Gilmore on a line, which was pretty cool. And, you know, I, that's where I kind of got my confidence. I could play in the NHL as a regular in the playoffs and so that was like in 94 right so um that was kind of when i were you wheeling around with these guys off the ice like who is your who is your buddy <laughs> sundine right i know i Sunday, see you guys yeah. snap or not snapchatting yeah. instagram story yeah all the time. yeah yeah matt's obviously is like a brother um you know we we're tied at the hip we sat next to each other on a bus the plane breakfast dinner you know all that <laughs> and, and you know he he was a shy guy quiet guy so he liked being around me because i was the guy yeah that, you would attract the people right <laughs> I mean, you would go out well yeah i was the one who kind of you know always took care of things for us and timo salani same thing in winnipeg it was the same thing and i was blessed to play with timo and when he scored 76 that year that was a fun year to to, to protect him and oh yeah that's right you were there for his rookie season yeah, yeah so I, I i'm not gonna go to the hall of fame but i'm in the hall of fame for assistant on his Record breaking goal. <laughs> Get the old oh, fuck yeah. off. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. I, I saw when, PG. Keep it PG, beast. Oh, I'm sorry. Best, yeah, yeah. Because if your daughter wants best. to listen, no, my my nieces and nephews. I'm they're... sorry. I'm sorry. We're gonna edit that. Gamelli's gonna edit all the swear words from this interview. My apologies. <laughs> Um, God, I forgot where I was. There. Oh, Timu Solani. So you know when special you special guy, special guy. When you yeah. when he went up to give his Hall of Fame speech, he had you written down in it. But you know when you get up there and the nerves start kicking in, and he actually forgot to mention you, and then you're you, you know he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And he was like showing you George the, Perils and I. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, you'll t- tell the story. Yeah. So. Uh, he mentions a bunch of people, and uh, you know you, you get two tickets, right? Like two, two tickets to give to people, and, and plus your wife, and you know you don't get a lot of tickets when you're going to the Hall of Fame. I know because of Mario and Matt and stuff. So, right. so I've been there with those guys, and uh, so, but he had us. You know, as his were you guest. the two tickets he gave for Peros and you? Yeah, and he forgot to mention. And, he, and for and, but it doesn't matter. He showed us after. He showed us a speech, and he had us in there. So, but George and I had some fun with that. It was oh, cool. I bet. Yeah, yeah you probably yeah. had to buy a few rounds after that. Yeah, yeah, no, it was it was good. He, he you know, team was a, one of the, one of the best teammates I ever had. Him and Matts, and obviously when I was in New York, protecting Messier was was a special. Like he taught me how to be a real pro, and uh, I was I was blessed to play with Messier for sure. Sure. That's how you said you couldn't be hurt. Did you ever have issues when you played? Like you hear about players having depression and those type of things. Did that ever affect you when you played? Or did you, did you, I'm just wondering because you, you wouldn't get hurt. So did you have those same issues at all? Like you know, you go down the dumps, going to depression or anything like that. Like well, you know. Well, I don't really think about that stuff. Okay. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of talk about it. Right. Um, there's a lot of guys that. Uh, Kind of been in brotherhood with Biz and I and what we've done, but uh, 
I try and help a lot of those guys right. um, quietly, and uh, I don't want to mention names, but uh, a lot over the years since I retired, you know, a lot of those guys kind of looked up to me or respected me, and, um, you know, I just try and be positive and happy every day, and, you know, life's too short, you know, I, and uh, as long as you try and be positive every day and make a difference, and that's kind of what I do, I, 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 I don't... Try to stay busy. That's for sure. You know, um, was uh, was Doug Gilmore the, the, their leader in that locker room when he was there? Yeah, he was, was but he wasn't there long, right? Because uh, uh, Mats came, right? And so they brought me in uh, when they traded Wendell for Mats. Uh, they brought me in to protect Mats, and that's what Burns said. You got to take care of this big Swede. He could. He, he's a difference maker. <laughs> you know, that's when Burnsy brought me in to protect Mats. And then Doug ended up uh, after that year, that first year where Mats and I were with him, he ended up. Uh, going on moving on but uh dougie was uh dougie made a big impact in toronto and uh, he's a great guy great teammate uh and you know i got to play with wendell too wendell came back a couple times right so i uh, you know i got to be friends with all those guys for all the years and i'm still friends with all those guys and you know the, the hockey as you know the hockey guys once you're friends with them and you see them it's like old times like you pick up right for your left off it's pretty cool i'll keep it light of this time uh i want to talk about the situation in philadelphia with the guy falling into the penalty box squirt and bottle tell it take us through that whole story i don't think a lot of our listeners are familiar with it well um you know philly i used to love playing there i really did you know the fans they loved me but they hated me i still get fan mail from flyers fans <laughs> we miss you the games aren't the same anymore <laughs> <laughs> um but i you know i was getting a beer poured on me and uh i, I got a, a lighter thrown at me and i turned around and i saw this guy you know and so i'm I think John LeClaire was in the other box. I said, Johnny, what color is your Powerade over there? He said, blue. I said, give me the, give me. <laughs> so he gave me the blue Powerade. And so I, I'm like, I'm going to think this guy had a white shirt on or whatever he had. And I, I, I want to make a stain on his shirt. So I started pouring the Gatorade. I started pouring the Gatorade on him, you know, the, the blue stuff. And then he, you know, the glass was really low. I was actually there to watch my son this year. The glass is as high. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like right to, the, to roof, the roof. Right yeah. to the roof now, but it's pretty funny. But it was shorter then. The glass was like not too high, and he kind of fell through. And, you know, I thought, I didn't think nothing was going to happen. But then he started punching Kevin Collins. And Kevin, you know, I'm pretty, as Biz knows, like we're close with all the linesmen and, and the referees. When when you're tough guys, you're close with those guys. And Kevin Collins was one of my, one of my boys, you know, so... Once he, once I seen him throw a punch at Kevin, then I stood. I gave him a couple jackhammers, <laughs> but he was a nice guy, and the whole thing happened. And I, you know, he was suing me. He was suing. Get the fuck out of here. The Flyers. He was suing Comcast. He was suing the NHL. He was suing everybody. And so I'm like, oh my god, what's going on here? And and, and every time he'd lose, he would appeal it. Well, it's costing me. It's yeah. cost because I'm paying for it. I had to hire pencil, you know, uh, counsel out of Pennsylvania too, right? So I had to hire the best lawyers in Pennsylvania, and I'm paying not the least. <laughs> so how much did I end up running you? A lot, a lot, 20? six figures. Get the hell out yeah, of here! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my god, that so, is brutal. I, I yeah. would assume maybe after well, I'm going you to breakfast, met up. Biz, I'm going. This is, a, and I'll tell you, give you the headline how it all ended. So I'm getting fed up because you know, it was appealing. His cousin's just doing it. His cousin apparently was a lawyer, and he's a really you could tell he's a, you know he was a, a bricklayer apparently. You know he's a really cool guy, and his name was Falcone, Chris Falcone. So I, I say to, I say to the lawyers, I meet a morning skate in Philly at the Four Seasons. There's four of them. I'm like guys, how much am I? How much is this breakfast costing me? I said. Are you kidding me? We have to get this thing done. Like, what's going on? Like, they can say, well, they're not tied. We're nothing we do. Yeah. The, the four of them come from. So it's just costing me. So I said, get me the guy's phone number. I want to call him. I want to talk to him. I want to see him. They're like, no, 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 no. We can't. I said, get me his phone number, please. I want to call him. So finally, they got me the guy's phone number. And I called him on the way to the game. And we had a couple of games left. And we were playing the Flyers in the playoffs. Okay? First round. So it's our second last game. So I said, Get me a strong So I, on, on the way of the game, I call him, and I and I said, Falcone, it's Ty Domi. He goes, who? The, don't screw around me, man. The, who, the, who is this? Who is this? I said, no, it's Ty Domi. Here, take my number. Four, and my n- number at the time was 416-407-DOMI, right? 3664. Of course it was. So I said, <laughs> three, I used every number for 3664-DOMI, right? That was my that was my thing. Surprised so you I, I said, I'm going to hang up. 
I, I'm gonna hang up. Call me back. I hang up. He calls back. I told you, man. Are you going to the game tonight? Yeah. Yeah. He's quiet. I said, okay, this is what's going to happen. We've got to do this low key. But I'm going to have security come bring you to a room. You and I are going to meet. I just want to talk to you face to face. And he said, okay, okay. I said, you promise? He goes, yeah. Game's over. Right away, I take my stuff off real quick and I go there because I wanted to, before any media, anybody came, I didn't want anybody around. We go in this room, <laughs> and he comes in, and he's like, he thinks that I'm going to want to fight him or something, right? And I'm like, hey, man, and I just shook his hand, and I hugged him. I said, hey, I'm a good guy, just like you. I said, you got wife and kids? And he says, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, well, we're, I'll tell you what. I said, we're playing the Leafs in the first round. How about if I fly you and your family to Toronto, put you up, and give you two tickets, uh, give you four tickets, and, uh, you know, we call it a day. We get this, you know. And he's like, yeah? I said, yeah. You might, You want to come to Toronto? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, okay. I shook it. And I told him, I said, just don't do, you know, don't tell the media or anything, right? Anyway, I, it's all done. I had him sign it off, everybody. So I got Comcast off. I got the Flyers off. I got NHL off. I got everybody off. He signed off on everything. And he came to Toronto. And God bless the guy. He's doing interviews in the stands. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, keep it under wraps. And all of a sudden. But it was okay. And that's, that's, that's the real story, how it all happened. And, uh, you know, it was, I, I, you know, people still talk about it everywhere. Were you the guy, were you the guy that uh, fought the fan in Philly? <laughs> so, you know, that's the real story. And that's how it ended. And, uh, I had to end it myself. No lawyers. So I was just say, funny what happens when you take the lawyers right out of it, huh? Yeah, lawyers. Man, oh man, they create more problems. Those guys. Are there any guys that I retired that you you know on friendly terms with all from back in the day, or, or was that stuff all these left on the ice? No, it's all left on the ice, and the guys, the literally that uh, that I battled against and fought against, uh, I think I have more respect for uh, than anybody because uh, I know how tough it was to do uh, on a day in a day out basis and. Uh, anytime I see or hear from any of those guys, it's always great to talk to them and, you know, see what they're doing and stuff. I, I really, uh, the hockey fraternity is something that's pretty cool. And, um, the people that, uh, that know you, know you when you see you that, uh, you know, you haven't changed and that's the whole thing is you, you still go at it with them with jabs and stuff. It's fun. We kind of glanced over your New York days. Uh, what do you remember most about playing in the big apple? <laughs> Those were fun. That probably the funnest times I had. Um, you know, I was. Were you getting after it a little bit? Uh, well, <laughs> I was single, you know. So, <laughs> and uh, you know, going to the going to the China Club, which after Studio Fifty Four, the China Club became kind of the, the place to go. And after the Probert fights, I I, <laughs> I became kind of a, king of the club, a, a celebrity in New York at a young age. So that was kind of cool, and then, you know that's how I you know became buddies with Mario and and uh, and Wahlberg from that place from China Club. You know, Mark was there going as Marky Mark, and uh, and then he became the Calvin Klein model, and so I got to know him pretty well, and we're still. You, you, you got a bunch of uh, celebrity buddies. Jay Z is one of your buddies. Well, yeah, <laughs> he's he's through uh, a Rod, uh, a Rod's birthday when uh, all, all all the Yankees were throwing in everybody in the pool, and Jay Z had a box of cigars in his hand the whole time. And anytime anybody tried to throw him in, he'd come over me and put his arm around me and smoke a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty so that you were protecting Jay Z yeah. during the party. We're the only two, a Rod says we're the only two dry ones at the end of the night. <laughs> But uh, A.J. Burnett was on the team from the Blue Jays, and he told everybody, don't piss this guy off. Don't piss this guy off. So every time Jay-Z, Jay-Z would just come up. What was he like? Who was that? Jay-Z. Like, what was Amazing he? guy. Amazing guy. He actually played basketball. And like, he was actually a really good basketball player. It was pretty impressive. He was going at it pretty hard. Like They were getting into the basketball games. You were trying hard. to get him to play soccer, bring back out your, your old skills. <laughs> well, that that was my number one sport, actually. I, you know, People laughed. You played soccer. I was actually a goal scorer, too. <laughs> that, was, that was my sport. But. Yeah, that- Another guy you had a few dances with was Rob Ray. Was it just some chemistry thing when you, anytime you two were on the ice, you just went at it? Well, I think, uh, you know, I chased him around in junior, our, yeah. our whole careers in junior, uh, and he never fought. He was actually a decent player in junior. And uh, Buffalo, Toronto was always, you know, the, the big deal. Right? They got a documentary coming out that they're going to air, correct? Yeah, it's on it. Yeah, it's, I actually, I uh, the people posted it on my Instagram last night. 
people the, were go, were going nuts for. I mean, obviously there was. You should like, check it out. Check it out. But the the, the trailer I watched for it, it looked yeah, it's like good. It was a Andrew fucking, Peters did it too. And the, Andrew Peters. Was a, yeah. I thought it was more interesting than the Top Gun two trailer. <laughs> right. All right. A- Andrew Absolutely. Peters, you know him at all? Yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's hilarious. A, oh, he's one. Of, he, he does radio there in Buffalo as well. And yeah, he was a tough customer. He had the couple. Instigators. He had a couple good goes against Ray Emery. Or at least one that yeah, I can remember. Yeah. Remember that he iconic was fight? He was tough. He always tells people he beat me up. I go, Petey, come on, seriously. Okay, like, I, I, I love you. He goes, Wait, I, he told Max, he goes, yeah, I beat your dad up. I beat your dad up, you know, but he just loves it. He loves the chirp, you know. <laughs> Would, uh, I mean, Rob Ray obviously did a good job of transitioning into media. You said you you did it briefly. Like, did it just not really interest you after the, your, your first experience? Well, um, you know, if I do it, and I might do it, um, it's going to be, you know, being normal and being real, right? I, I don't need someone telling me, well, you know, what to say or what to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm not that type of guy. I never have been as a, as a player or in life. So um, if I do do something in which, you know, the opportunities have come quite a bit, um, and I've always said no because I want Max to get the spotlight in his life and his career. Now he's played five years, so I'm starting to consider a little bit. But, you know, there's been a lot of cannabis companies and a lot of – whiskey companies and stuff just like you biz you know i'm just trying to keep you're up a hustler with you. just trying to keep up like oh, you yeah, fine. go ahead another tale um you were scratched one time and you stayed at the hotel till the second period of the game is that true is that a true story or is that it was i think it might have been under burns you were scratched you were so pissed off you got a healthy scratch you stayed at the hotel you're, he's uh, giving you that the... wasn't with pat burns i've okay. never scratched with pat burns okay I, that, i'm not that would have no that was uh, that was uh that was uh in montreal i was uh scratch healthy scratch actually john ferguson jr he asked me about people who i dislike in hockey he's probably the guy that i don't have any time for at all he actually single-handedly ruined the toronto maple Leafs for many many years really yeah he's the guy for sure so he's the guy like what just make he had it out for me from the day he took the job in toronto i don't know why but uh you know i think he found out that uh, i was kind of the glue of that team and when he got rid of me you know they (laughs) and matt's was the most pissed off guy you know when when they got rid of me so they missed uh, the missed the playoffs. I don't know, like ten years after I left. So, you know, that's that's John Ferguson single handedly. He ruined that team, um, and he put that team back many many years. But uh, that's the one guy that probably you know I don't. Yeah, going back to your question earlier, uh, you're super protective of Max, uh, an unbelievable kid. Which I mean, I, I don't blame you, man. You love your kid to death. H- how long uh, did it take you to realize this kid might have what it takes to make the NHL? At what age? People always ask me that question, and I always say that, you know, ironically enough, um, you know that brick tournament in Edmonton? It's it's all the top. I wasn't good enough to play it's all that the one top time. kids. It's all the top kids in North America. Yeah. It's all the top kids in North America and out of Quebec. It's called the brick tournament. Oh, Actually, it's out of Quebec. Okay, I thought you uh, said no, Edmonton. No, out of Edmonton. Sorry, oh, Edmonton. Is it before the, the Quebec major, uh, the Quebec yeah. PB tournament? Quebec is 12. Okay. Um, and uh, no Toronto teams played in that Quebec tournament, by the way. So he didn't get to play in that. But the but the brick tournaments in Edmonton, and my friend Bill Comrie actually started it um, when you know Mike was young. Oh, and that's okay. Was, okay. Yeah, that's so, the connection. Excuse yeah, me. yeah. So so it's the top kids in North America, and Max actually led that tournament in scoring. And uh, I remember Bill showing me a list of all the guys who played in that tournament, and there were all the top scorers in that tournament were all in the NHL. At ten years old, I'm like, "Holy smokes, that's that's serious." And Max was the leader up until a couple of years ago, that all time leading scorer of that tournament. When, since he, you know, and when he was ten, right? So you knew that that was kind of, you know, he was a gifted kid, and he actually led the tournament scoring, scoring one goal, and the rest were all assists. So he still has that problem of shooting the puck, <laughs> but uh, he always pass, 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 pass. He's always been that kid because he's always he likes to please everybody and pass, pass, pass. And when when it counts, he starts to shoot. And last year he shot, and he started to shoot again. So hopefully he keeps shooting. As an old school guy, do you ever get frustrated watching today's game when a, a dirty hit happens and nobody sticks up for the teammate? <laughs> well, ask Biz. Are we gonna get you in trouble? <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, you know, my son, uh, you know, watching my son play junior, uh, being the leading school, goal scorer, and having guys trying to hurt him, uh, that that wasn't too easy to be, be watching as a father. You ask, uh, being a father and watching that, that was 
But I fortunately didn't. for Max, he can stick up for himself, though. Yeah, but unfortunately, when you're a leading scorer of the team, you, right, don't, you, you don't, don't want, want to. You don't want him to. They're trying to get him off the ice. They're trying to piss him off. And so that's uh, that was the toughest part as a father, watching that transition in the game. Because, you know, when I played junior, I protected Mike Ricci. <laughs> when I turned pro, I protected all the guys who were leading scorers. So my son didn't go have, you know, the benefit of having that. So unfortunately, he has the my DNA and, he, you know, we're trying to get him to control a little more. And I think he's getting better at it. And uh, I think he understands it. It really doesn't affect the game much anymore. You know, it just it doesn't. And yeah. uh, you just got to keep your head up and be alert. And I think a lot of the injuries happen by accident. Um, because there's no no uh, red line and guys are just flying and getting hit by accident, or you know, the, obviously uh, guys aren't protecting themselves. So you can't just go into the boards and turn your back and not expect to get hit. You got to protect yourself. So I think there's a lot lot to do with you know, the accountability. And you know, when we played, we made guys accountability and accountable for what they're doing. And uh, I think the league wanted to take kind of that out of the game, and they they're trying to. Really, you know, police the game. And I think the way we did it, I think it made guys a little more reluctant and a little more hesitant to do things. And I think they, you know, they they knew if they hit somebody that I was coming, you know, that, yeah. that a probie was coming. And, like, they just knew. And now there's no more accountability that way. You might get a suspension or, you know, a fine, but it's not really – you know, um, like, not, it, like it was. That yeah. deterrent on the other team just isn't there yeah. anymore. Yeah, so it's a little different, right? we got to talk about your relationship with Mario Lemieux. And how, how did that all start? <laughs> Everybody always asks that question, too. He actually told it at my, uh, at my birthday party, which uh, was quite ironic because him saying anything, you know, kind of, you know, it's like pulling teeth, right? But he actually told everybody the story and... I was skating around. I mean, he was skating around warm up at Madison Square Garden. He was Marilyn Lemieux, you know, 91, 92, MVP and Stanley Cup and everything. Had the long hair. And uh, I heard him say something. And I'm like, what? I'm stretched at center ice, got my foot over the red line. <laughs> I'm staring down Jay Caulfield, you know, <laughs> skating around. <laughs> and I said, what'd you say? And he's laughing. He kept skating around. He's laughing. And then he comes back to center ice. He does a circle at center. And I'm like against the boards and I'm stretching down on the ice. And he comes over and he's, you know, he's so tall. He's so tall and he bends over. And I'm just ready to say, what? And he says, no, Ty, seriously, can you get me and 10 of my teammates in a China club tonight? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> it's Mary Lemieux, right? So, so uh, anyway, he goes on and he ends up you know, scoring four goals. And, get out of here. Yeah. And then right to China, China club. Game's over and everything. And we had a closed door meeting. I still got my pants and my skates on, but I got my stuff off and we had 10 minute meeting whatever and then a meeting at 10 15 minutes at least and then the media all comes in like you know like a bunch of you know it's like a bunch, bunch of cattle coming in yeah and then the security guy says ty Marilyn muse at the door i'm like what it's like Marilyn Muse at the door. So I get I walk there with my skates on and pants. We got my straps still on. So, and he's standing there with his hair gelled and everything with a tie on, suit and everything. I already showered. He must have had one of those showers that just, you know, walked through. Well, he didn't, he didn't play the third period. He probably <laughs> just shut it down. Just got and he of- said, are we all set? And I'm like, uh, he just embarrassed us. But, you know, I said, go. I'll call over. And go. He said, you got to come, right? You got to come for a drink, right? I said, ah, I don't know. He just kind of embarrassed us. Anyway, I ended up going. And uh, you know, hit it off there, and friends ever since. Been best buddy since. Now yeah. you're basically part owner of the, the Pittsburgh Penguins. I see in the owner's box just yeah. as much. Well, as when he was winning, uh, well, when he actually went through tough times when he was going to lose a team, um, you know, that was a that was a difficult. That was time. a cr- yeah weird time. Yeah, and, and uh, Crosby. And I was the rest. actually with him when you know that whole thing happened when they get, got Crosby. Get the lottery and Crosby. I was with him. Yeah, it was it was quite a surreal moment. What was to, his ne- What was his reaction when he first heard the news? Like what? Like what? What, what did he say? Well, he said, Holy fuck! We just got crossed. He still has the ice packs on his cheeks. They have, they have, <laughs> he can't get that smile off his face. But it changed. You know, it changed life. But it couldn't happen to a better person or a family. Him and Natalie are. You know, like like my brother. He is so chill. Eh? He, yeah, he, he, and, and Natalie's like my sister. You know, so I'm very close with the family and the kids. And uh, you know, they're a special family. They're, you know. I'd be best buddies forever. You know, Sid told the story on the podcast when they, they he got a dog and, and Mario had to clean up its shit because uh, it took a dump. Where, where did it take a dump? In his living room or something? Yeah, somewhere. somewhere so he gets home and Mario and Muse clean up his dog shit. So. <laughs> well, you know, story, I, I, I got my hip uh, surgery in Pittsburgh 
and uh, Mario picked me up at the hospital. And uh, I stayed in his guest room in Pittsburgh. Uh, and, you know, I was sick. I, I, I was getting sick throwing up. He was walking me to the toilet, holding me up. I'm Come puking. on. I was throwing up. Is this while you were playing or did you get it when yeah, you were done? Yeah, 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 when I was playing. So, he, you know, he was he's a, he's a real guy. And uh, I'm one of the few that are pretty blessed to be very close to him, like a brother. And Natalie is the same. They're just special. That's uh, awesome. Special people, yeah. You follow the, uh, the game on a day to day basis. Keep tabs on every game, every score, like a, like a legit fan. Or no, I try. I try. You know, I love I love watching hockey, obviously, and uh, but I try. You know, we all we all got you know busy lives and right. do, do uh, a lot of different things. But uh, I try and you know watch most of Montreal Canadiens games, <laughs> and uh, obviously watch my friends' teams. Uh, and you know, I, uh, last night I watched Arizona after. Montreal game and Taylor Hall, uh, you know, making that play on the winning goal. Was, you know, that's why trades happen. And it makes it things curious and they're in first place. I'm so happy for talk, you know, in Arizona because uh, they, you know the, the, they've been uh, suffering for a long time out there. Um, anything else you want to? Any any other stories you wanted to share before we wrap this thing up? I mean, we've taken enough of your time. Uh, uh, you were incredible. I like diving deep into the the psychological aspect of the fighting. Any other stories? Whatever, no. <laughs> I love your honesty. You're just out, you're out of control. <laughs> no, I, no. You know, I at the end of the day, we we all try and be ourselves, right? Keep it real. And uh, I think what's uh, what's most important is you know when people uh, treat you with respect. You know, you, you give it back. And I've always been that way. And Biz, you've been always very respectful. And, well, I wouldn't cross you because you'd fucking feed me my lunch either, either way. But you always been pretty funny, Biz. Oh, yeah. was, Look, it, looks so. aren't everything. Uh, we we actually forgot to ask you about Erica and how you, how you became so close with our CEO. Now you're kind of training her and, and turning into this hockey player. Erica, she's a. Let me tell you, like you talk about female uh, leaders and CEOs. And when I first met her, I, I was very impressed with her how she came across and she's very straightforward, like very clear and straightforward. And she said first thing she said is i'm i just started hockey and i love it and i said do you love it and she said yeah i love it what can you tell me i said just keep if if you love it just keep enjoying it and she kept sending me messages that this is what i did today this is what i did today this is what i'm doing she's a better skater than me now she could skate backwards better than me yeah <laughs> <laughs> i could never skate backwards <laughs> but uh and then she made this sweater that uh said Ty Domi is my spirit animal. She made a sweatshirt, and people start asking, me, how, "How can I get those sweatshirts?" <laughs> Through Bar- Barstool Sports uh, Sports so, Store. So I told her, Eric, I said, "People want these sweats." She goes, "I'll make them. I'll make it." But uh, you know, it's great to see someone so passionate about the game, and uh, she's really loving hockey. and And that's what I said, like uh, you know, the, what's going on with uh, women's hockey. I think it. You say, you know what what i'd like to talk about that's one thing i think is 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 really needs a push is women's hockey because we want we want girls growing up to have some kind of inspiration to to say hey i can play pro hockey and just like a lot of these girls that that have done it and uh, they're going to the hall of fame and to take that away from them, i think is is just a shame and i think the nhl and, and the nhlpa really have to get involved in okay that. so you think they need to, to buck up and think of a structure where they can, yeah. they can set something up and even if it's at a loss for a few years to to, to get it going a hundred percent and all the markets that make money you know in, in hockey i think you, you could pick six of the top um big money makers and good franchise even if it's original six right right let these girls have something because they're fifty percent of the fans out there. They're fifty percent of paying the salaries out there, right? So you got to give them something, and I think that's something where I think, you know, the and the PA and NHL have a lot of differences, and uh, you know, I think the PA, I you know, I, I've been living in this game for a long time, and you know, everybody pays their dues, and you know what you get when you retire from the NHL PA. You still got to pay your health insurance. I, I, I think that's one thing that the NHLPA has to do is take care of players forever sure. that played over 200 games. And there's 1,200 guys. Well, I played 202, so I'm definitely down with that. Uh, that right. Rule there's change. only 1,200 guys living that played. Right. Yeah, only twelve hundred guys. It's it's actually crazy the amount of p- players that have played in the NHL. People think it's such a high number. I it's think twelve hundred. 
twelve hundred to play two hundred games that, that are living. That are living. Yeah, I think that's all what time. I mean. It's 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 under like five thousand players all There's time. There's only twelve hundred to, to today. Yeah. So you know the NBA has health care forever. You, so think about it. You're paying dues for what? I paid. I played seventeen years, and after that, I got to pay thirty five, forty thousand. Expensive a year for health care. You got to do something. So if you're not taking care of girl, if you're not taking care of women's hockey, and you're not taking care of your players after their careers. What are you doing? So the NHLPA has to really sure. kind of. St- I mean, I would. Start ne- I would never argue that point. It's, it, I would just say it's hard to you know force a business to to take a loss, knowing that. But if they could set something up in order to make a revenue stream and, and make it be able to. Start. Have you watched a game? Have oh, you watched uh, a women's game? Yeah. Well, I watch when they're usually at the Olympics. I Did just, you watch a live game? Oh, I've no, no, I've never been to a live females game. I don't. Okay, think. Okay. Well, I've been to a few live. There you games. go. All right. So do yourself a favor. All right. And go watch a women's Fucking live rights. game. I will. And I watched it. I watched them three times now. I watched it twice in Montreal, once in Toronto. And let me tell you, they got a lot of skill, and not only skill, they got a lot of heart, and they leave it all out there. And you know, paying fans will go see these. Will go see these girls, a woman play. And you think eventually it can markets. become a you know a lucrative thing. I, I, or at least keep itself afloat. I definitely do. Fifty percent right. of the crowd is 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 girls and women. All so right. like, you're going to have interest. If you're, and and what do they have right now? They don't have anything right now. They don't have anything because it's gotten taken away from. Them. So I'm a true believer. It's got to it's got to be fixed, and uh, it, that's on the NHLPA okay. and the and the NHL to to get that right. I love it. Well, Ty, thank you for joining us. Um, you're a, you're a beauty. Uh, congrats on a hell of a career. And uh, the the record in fights, 333. I guess it's something that will never be broken now, eh, Biz? It won't even, nobody will scratch the surface. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to get over 100 anymore <laughs> starting now. Really? So, yeah, it's a, it's a little, what'd you end up with? I have no idea. Not even, I, didn't, I didn't even get the double digits. I was getting all my, my face beat in the minors, Ty. Well, you know, but the, and the one thing I wanted to tell you about the penalty minutes thing, you know, you were saying third all time. When I started my career, the tens in a game misconduct, they were eliminated. Oh, so you had to penalty, earn those. From, from the penalty minutes, right? When Tiger Williams fought, he would get two, five, ten in a game. So he'd get 27 minutes every time he would get in a fight at the end of the game. He just did it. He, he did it all the time. So people ask me, how did Tiger Williams have so much, uh, so many more penalty minutes? You know, but you Twos know, and so tens. Two, no, no. Tens and game misconduct. Right, but the I'm game misconducts are ten too. You get the other two and ten, right? Because it, it, they kind of came side and side. But I get what you're saying. So it's twenty seven minutes. Twenty seven minutes. So yeah. you, you get ten and you get a game. So that's twenty minutes. Jesus Christ! <laughs> and then you get five and you get two for instigate. So right. two, five, ten in the game. That's yeah. twenty seven minutes every time. And if you look up the stats, how many times yeah, that happened? You probably should have got a lot of tens in your day, Ty. So <laughs> once again, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, and, uh, we'll have to fun. get you on again when Wit's back. Thanks, Thanks for guys, joining yeah. us, Ty. Yeah, Much where is Wit? What happened to Wit? Uh, he had to go to NHL Network tonight. Oh yeah. Yeah, and we couldn't pass you up, dude. Say so hi to him. I will. All right, guys. Love you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.